Uh, we'll start broadcasting. All right, starting now. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. From wherever you are joining us and whenever you might be joining us, whether it's live today or on a recorded session, welcome. And thank you for being part of the UCSF School of Dentistry Global Oral Health Symposium. My name is Ben Chaffee. I am the Director of the Program in Global Oral Health at the UCSF School of Dentistry, and it is my privilege to host this event today. We're so grateful for our speakers willing to share their expertise with us today, and also for our audience for taking time out of your busy schedules to be part of this event. It's humbling to see so many people register and attend, especially when I spend the weeks leading up to this event, wondering if the only person coming is going to be my mother. So thank you, Dad, for coming too. Uh, this is our 11th symposium. And we're always excited for the chance for our audience, including our UCSF dental students, to meet accomplished researchers, oral health advocates, and leaders who have been featured in our symposia over the years. It's also a chance to bring together accomplished speakers who may not have known each other previously. Uh, of course, that's not the case this year, as two of our speakers, Dr. Marco Perez and Dr. Karen Perez, uh, don't share the last, same last name by coincidence. Uh, they also share a household. And they also share a highly revered standing among oral health epidemiologists globally. While they of course collaborate, they independently and individually have built outstanding careers as cutting edge methodologists and as scientists with a keen eye for the public policy implications of their work. Uh, as their career journeys have taken them from Brazil to Australia and now to Singapore, they have been generous collaborators and prolific mentors and they've influenced the career paths of scholars on all three of those continents. Two of those scholars are now rising stars in the field, Dr. Elena Shu and Dr. Dandara Hogg. They are building their own impressive contributions to our field and our understanding and our ability to improve oral health. We're very grateful to hear from all of our speakers today. You can read more about our speakers and our topics for presentation today and our event program. That'll be available in a link coming up in the chat, and you can also find that on our website. Speaking of the chat function, a couple of housekeeping items. This is a Zoom webinar, which means you'll see two types of chat functions on your menu bar. 
use the chat function if you're having technical difficulties and we'll do our best to address those. But use the Q&A function to send in questions and comments for the speakers. After each talk, we'll have a few minutes set aside to address those questions. And make sure you use Q&A because that's the only way we can be sure that we see your questions. Don't be shy about sending them during the talks, but remember we'll address them after each talk uh, instead of stopping the flow of the presentations. And so with that, why don't we now take a couple of minutes for a recorded message from the Dean of the UCSF School of Dentistry, Dr. Michael Reddy. Greetings. As Dean of UCSF School of Dentistry, I'm honored to welcome you to our school's 11th Global Oral Health Symposium. Thank you for joining us. And a special thank you to our speakers from Singapore and Australia who are joining us very early in the morning their time. Thank you. The symposium has a record of drawing world-renowned speakers and supporting vital research projects in public health epidemiology and basic sciences in the realm of global oral health. As you know, research is an important part of what makes UCSF so impactful worldwide. This year's event centers on the theme that guides much of our work as healthcare professionals, achieving oral health equity. Today, we are fortunate to have one of, as one of our keynote speakers, Dr. Marco Perez, Director of Research and Senior Principal Investigator at National Dental Research Institute, Singapore. Dr. Perez is also Professor and Director of the Academic Clinical Program in Oral Health and, a health, ser and health Services and Systems Research Program at Duke NUS Medical School in Singapore. Today, he will be speaking about the latest work of the Lancet Commission on Oral Health. You know, in just a short time, this research has led to several influential position papers and strategies for rethinking how to best advance population oral health. Our second speaker is another keynote, Dr. Karen Perez, an internationally recognized researcher in the field of child oral health and oral epidemiology. She is a principal investigator at National Dental Research Institute, Singapore, and associate professor at Duke NUS Medical School. Dr. Perez served for many years on the research advisory committee of the Australian Dental Research Foundation and the South Pacific Child Oral Health Task Force. We're also grateful to have talented presenters here today that will also share some of their latest findings related to oral health equity. Our first presenter, Dr. Dondera Haig, is a dentist and epidemiologist from the University of Adelaide in Australia. She studies early life adversity and out of home care experiences in racial oral health inequities. Our second presenter, Dr. Helena Scooch, studies inequities in health, focusing on social and economic and racial inequities in oral health. She is currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the Federal University of Pelotos in Brazil and a visiting researcher within the University of Adelaide. All, to all of our speakers, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. And let's turn over the floor to our first speaker, Professor Marco Perez. Good morning, Ben, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, well, it's 6 a.m. on the 12th of May in Singapore. So good morning, everyone to this, in this part of the world. Good afternoon for those people in San Francisco. Thank you for attending this symposium today. I would like to thank you, Ben, for a kind invitation, a kind introduction, and the opportunity to be here today at the UC SF Global Oral Health Symposium. It's a normal pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you very much. Well, I cannot move my slide. Okay, now. 
Well, my task today is to give you a quick overview of the Lancet Commission on Oral Health, to highlight the background and origins of the Commission, its general purpose, to report the progress we made so we have made so far, and to present the next steps. So, a brief uh, of the background. At the end of 2018, the Lance editor, Dr. Richard Horton, contacted our colleague, Professor Richard Watt from UCL, expressing his interest in having a series on oral health published in the Lancet. Professor Watt then invited 12 colleagues from different parts of the world, including myself, to prepare what is called the Lancet series on oral health. The launch of the Lancet series on oral health happened in July 2019, pre-epidemic, so in London at UCL. It's important to highlight that this was the first time in almost 200 years that the Lancet, one of the most prestigious journals in medicine, addressed oral health. This is a photo of the launch ceremony with some of uh, known faces, some authors, the editor of The Lancet, and you can see uh, also your colleague here, uh, Kristen Kent from the uh, UCSF uh, School of Dentistry. The Lancet series on oral health includes a cover, editorial, two articles, two commentaries, a profile of the leader of the series, uh, Professor Watt, in a historical perspective of dentistry. The first paper describes the importance of oral disease as a public health issue, addresses the individuals and societal impacts of oral disease and the profound socioeconomic inequalities in oral health. If in the first paper, we presented a panorama of the problems. In the second paper, we proposed actions to tackle the problems already presented. Let me now briefly justify why oral disease are a public health issues. And this is particularly relevant for those uh, uh, dental students that perhaps never uh, seen this kind of uh, information. The most common oral conditions fulfill all criteria to be considered public health problems. Despite being largely preventable, oral diseases are highly prevalent throughout the life course and have substantial adverse effects on individuals, communities, and the wider society. Oral diseases are global public health problems with particular concern over the rising prevalence in many low and middle income countries linking to the wider social, economic and commercial changes. Just let me start to talk a bit about the prevalence or, and the impact of oral health conditions. Untreated dental cares in permanent teeth is the most prevalent conditions among all conditions investigating the global border of disease studies, uh, which include over 300 different conditions affecting almost 2.5 billion people worldwide. Um, treated dental caries in deciduous teeth was the 10th most prevalent conditions. Severe periodontitis is the sixth most prevalent conditions in the world. The prevalence of endentate people, complete tooth loss, decreased for 4.4% uh, for to 2.3% uh, over the last decades. Complete tooth loss affect 158 million people worldwide. In addition to that, severe tooth loss, which is defined by having fewer than nine remaining permanent teeth, shows a significant decline in its prevalence and incidence in the last decades. Finally, and not more, very importantly, Lips and oral cavity cancers are among the top 15 most common cancers worldwide, with over half a million incident cases in 2018. The total number of deaths due to cancer of lip and oral cavities in this year was almost 200,000, of which 67% six, in males. Data from the same year, 2018, showed that oral cancer has the highest incidence among all cancers in South Asia, the region where I mean today, among males, 
and it's the leading cause of cancer-related mortality among males in India and Sri Lanka. Furthermore, among males living in countries with a low or medium human development index, the age standardized rate of oral cancer is the fourth highest of all cancers. So it's quite relevant uh, in terms of uh, uh, epidemiology. So 3.5 billion people were affected by oral conditions globally. Oral conditions, however, disproportionately affect impoverished and social disadvantaged members of society. A strong and social Grad, a social and uh, a consistent social gradient exists between socioeconomic status and prevalence and, and, and severity of oral disease. Oral disease can be considered as a sensitive clinical marker of social disadvantages, being an early indicator of population new health linked to deprivation. Oral disease and oral health inequalities are directly influenced by wider social and commercial determinants which are the underlying drivers of poor population oral health. There is a consistent body of evidence linking socioeconomic position and oral health. A 2015 systematic review assessed the association between socioeconomic position and caries experience in over 150 studies involving a total of over 300,000 participants. The association between low education background and heavy experience care was significantly higher in countries with higher uh, human development index score relative to countries with low index score, even after adjustment for potential confounders. Lower socioeconomic position was also significantly associated with having untreated caries lesion or any caries experience. These finds were confirmed by an updated systematic review performed in 2018. Another systematic review showed that disadvantaged socioeconomic circumstances were associated with poor periodontal health, even controlling for smoking. Association between low socioeconomic status and oral cancer was found in both low middle income countries and also in high income countries, even after adjustment from behavior confounders. Studies of socioeconomic inequalities in dental caries over the life course of individuals are rare and have mostly focused on population based cohort studies from the needing in New Zealand and Pelotas in Brazil. Findings from these birth cohort studies show that untreated dental caries and periodontal disease in adulthood were negatively associated with childhood socioeconomic conditions. Um, homeless, refugees, prisoners, disabled people have more untreated dental cares, tooth loss, toothache than the general population, which serves as a classic example of cliff edge of inequalities, as you can see in this figure here. This infograph prepared by the Lancet team illustrates the Nico and unfair distribution of oral disease across populations and give a clear picture to lay people beyond the dental field to understand the impact of those diseases. Oral disease affect individuals, families, and societies. Let me give some examples. Lost time from school and adverse effects on school performance due to oral conditions have been identified in several studies from different parts of the world. General anesthesia, for example, due to dental reasons is the second most important cause of hospitalization among children in Australia. In Canada, dental related issues result in an average of 3.5 five hours of lost working time per person per year, costing 40 million lost work, uh, work uh, hours, a productivity loss of over 1 billion Canadian dollars. In Australia, 9% of employed people missed one or more half days in a year due to dental problems with lost productivity costs of 606 million Australian dollars. 
even in other countries like in Brazil, a national-wide study showed that orofacial pain, pain led to 50% absent from work in the last six months before the survey. Moreover, worldwide in 2015, dental disease account for 357 billion American dollars in direct costs and 188 billion American dollars in indirect costs. In the 28 European Union member states in 2015, dental disease costs were 9 billion euros, ranking third behind diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So this is particular for dental students to illustrate how important uh, dental diseases are and how uh, impactful they, uh, they affect the society. Let me talk briefly about the social and commercial determinants on oral health. This is very, it's very well known. The WHO conceptual framework for an action on social determinants of health highlights the how structural determinants can generate social hierarchies and influence socioeconomic status of individuals within societies, which in turn influence health through the circumstance in which people live, work, and age in the risk for disease. Equal concern now need to be focused on the commercial determinants of health. Commercial determinants of health are defined as strategies and approaches used by the private sector to promote products and choice that are detrimental to health. This is quite a new concept that we need to, to, to consider in our uh, actions, research, and policies. As you can see in this graph, an increase in the global production of sugar over the last four decades. And this one is a, a impactful uh, uh, illustration of the power and influence of big sugar companies uh, here. As you can see, just to give an, a clear example, Coca-Cola spent in one year in Africa almost three times the total WHO budget for a year. So it's quite impressive. In addition to determinants of oral disease, we also face limitations of the current dental care systems. So which leads uh, Professor Watt uh, state that dentistry in a state of crisis. Why? The limitations of the current system including, include treatment focus, a mismatch between need and availability and location of service uh, if you can remember uh, the inverse care law. So those people who need more don't have access uh, and use of service. Payment system, the privilege of or the prioritization of pay for fee for service. We need to recognize that our profession is still working in isolation, have poor plan, and downstream prevention instead of upstream prevention. So the Lance editor, Dr. Richard Horton, after the Lancet series on oral health, expressed his enthusiasm with the series. Based on the Lancet series on oral health, he called us for a radical reform of dental care system and for an articulate movement to tackle the social and commercial determinants of oral disease. In that time, he announced the Lancet Commission on Oral Health. But what's the Lancet Commission? A Lancet Commission is a scientific review, inquiry, and response to a neglect health predicament. As you can see, uh, oral disease fulfill all these criteria. A Lancet Commission is also a science-led international multidisciplinary collaborations aimed to achieve transformation change with a particular focus on policy or political action. We have some core ingredients of a successful commission. Should present a bold and transformative message must develop a compelling and convincing story, should be innovative, offer a critical and challenging view for change, 
be forward thinking, convene great people with a balance in terms of gender and geographic uh, uh, representation, be inspiring and optimistic, think big, provide actionable conclusions for political policy and professional audience and bodies, and create, this is important, active afterlife to achieve long-term and sustainable impact. So we have a very ambitious uh, 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 aims. Some examples of the Lancet Commission in different fields can be seen here in this slide. As you can see, if you go to the Lancet uh, uh, webpage, you can access different uh, series of the Lancet Commission. Let me briefly talk about the progress that we made so far. Well, actually we have 27 uh, commissioners uh, all over the world, as you can see in the map. It's beyond the dental field, included 13 authors of the series plus 14 another colleagues beyond the dental field, including uh, members of the social uh, movements, epidemiologists, public health researchers, and public health advocates, advocacy. The commission is led by uh, Professor Richard Watt and Dr. Carol Guarnizio-Reno, who are the chairs. And here you can see some well-known faces from uh, US, Canada, uh, Scotland, Fiji, South Africa, Brazil, Ireland, and here from India, US, Canada again, German, Brazil, the WHO, Kenya, and Australia. According to one of the criterion, uh, we need to follow and represent diversity and balance between genders, low, middle, and high-income countries. In our agenda, What's progress, uh, the progress to date? Well, a launch meet held in, 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 in London, pre-pandemic, start the work exactly one week before intended to have the IDR, who uh, unfortunately has been canceled. In that time, you formulate a broad vision and define a set of, of key uh, priorities. We established three core working groups to develop working plans across the commissioners. We held regular meetings, presentations, and discussions, and moving forward with initial researchers. Uh, our research, this is the, the photo of the uh, Lancet meeting, the Lancet Commission meeting pre-pandemic. Pre What's the mission of the commission? To sustainably improve global oral health, a very ambitious uh, aim, and promote equity in terms of population, oral health status, access to service, and quality of care, both within and between countries. The vision of the commission is to raise political and po policy profile of oral health at international, national, and community uh, levels, promote population oral health equity, reform, oral health care system and challenge invested interest group that undermine population oral health. Again, very ambitious vision. And in interesting, the audience of the Lancet Commission must be beyond the field, our field. We need to uh, target politicians, policymakers and professional leaders civil social movements in a broader public health and global health community, of course, including our oral health community. We have established key priorities, uh, as you can see here. The governance advocate for global oral health, a permanent work in convincing our allies and the general public, policymakers and influence about the importance of or global oral health to address the equity and social inequalities in oral health, one of the core markers of our uh, uh, area. To promote the health system reform, to integrate oral health into the national health systems, uh, uh, forward uh, uh, in universal health care, 
and to address the commercial determinants. So we have some key areas to work with. So let me briefly describe the next steps. So we moved ahead with program of research divided into those uh, groups. Recently, we've been uh, uh, great to Richard Watt, Gotta, and HR uh, Global Health big grant to conduct our work over the next uh, two, three years. And we are combined theoretical and empirical work uh, using a red collected data globally, but also to produce new uh, data, including qualitative research in many different settings of the world, like in Colombia, in Brazil, and in India, and in Africa. So this is uh, still in progress. Uh, we, we start a seminar series. I'm very uh, proud to announce that the first seminar will be the my pleasure to be the chair. Uh, we have as the speakers, the, the very pre prestigious uh, speakers like uh, Michael Marmot, Professor Michael Marmot and Professor Cesar Victor, Victor uh, along with Dr. Carol Guarniz Erheno. This is uh, planned to be uh, held in the second semester of this year and be advertised uh, widely. So we are undertaking process of external consultation with key stakeholders beyond the dental field. For example, the new, uh, the non-communicable disease alliance among others. We need to finalize the report and in parallel, we are preparing other publications to be uh, uh, initially target the Lancet uh, uh, journal or the Lancet family, as you're familiar, the Lancet journal has uh, uh, many other uh, publications in different areas in public health, in pediatrics, and in, in global health. So we need to finalize the report and the publications and plan ahead for a, a research agenda. So we have some opportunities ahead uh, uh, with shared visions. But it's important for you in the US that we are aligned with the US Surgeon General Report on Oral Health. This is quite uh, uh, relevant, uh, the way that the oral health uh, has been addressed. And also, we align it with FDI World of Health Federation uh, Vision 2030 report. So this is important to, to uh, work together with these uh, uh, institutional bodies. More recently, in the WHO uh, assembly, oral health was again included as one of the priorities. And this is opportunity that you need to took, uh, we need to take advantage of these opportunities of inclusion of oral health in the global uh, public health agenda. So in brief, this is the, the, the picture that I would like to describe in terms of our commission. Of course, we have a lot of details and more than keen to answer, to take your questions. But I can conclude that global public health, uh, the oral disease are a, public, a global public health issue. We need to recognize and trying to overcome the limitations of the current oral health care systems. For that, it's, it's necessary a radical reform and transformation, including dental education. This is a unique opportunity for major global progress. And we need collaboration, joint actions, including policy, education, and research. So as stated in the last editorial, oral health at a typing point. I would like to acknowledge the Borough Foundation, UCL Fact of uh, Population Health, uh, the, the uh, British agents, the commissioners and the Lancet team for the opportunity to deliver uh, this uh, presentation and to share the view of the Lancet Commission with you. Thank you very much and feel free to contact me if you like. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Perez, that was fantastic. Um, I'll let the audience, I'll direct them to the Q&A function if you want to send in any questions. We have a couple in already, um, but please, we've got some time for a few more. A couple of the questions had to do with just uh, accessing the, the video recording, which we will 
distribute as a link to everyone who's registered. We'll post it on our website. Uh, in terms of looking at the data or some of the articles, uh, I believe we were directed to go to the Lancet Commission's um, website where you can find lots of different issues and articles. Um, is that the best place to find data supporting this presentation? Marco, you'd agree going, the Lancet Commission has a website set up for uh, oral health in particular, right? Exactly. This is nested in the UCL Department of, of, of Public Health, particularly in the dental public health setting. I can uh, share with you later on if you if you if you like, definitely. Yeah, we'll find that and we'll we'll send that out. UCL, yep. Yeah. Um, so one of the, the questions has to do with um, associations between dental caries and socioeconomic status. And you showed some very convincing data of socioeconomic gradients in the occurrence of dental caries. Uh, but the question coming from the audience is that that's not necessarily always the case, particularly if you're looking at socioeconomic status at a country level. And uh, uh, the audience member points out the prevalent, low prevalence of dental caries in some low income countries in the Africa region. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, let me, well, the picture that I, I presented today, thank you for the question, just to clarify, this is based on the global border of disease study. And if you can see, we have very few uh, social uh, uh, oral health indicators. And I'm not talking about experience or prevalence of dental caries. I'm talking here and I talk here about untreated dental cares, which mean cavitated caries, without treatment. That's the picture. And this is a very consistent uh, association with socioeconomic gradients as Ben uh, pointed out. So I'm not talking about prevalence, you are right. In some African countries, the prevalence is really low, but I'm trying, I'm, I'm, I'm talking here about, uh, if you like, uh, the, for the, the old, older people like me, the carry index is the proportion of, 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 of uh, affected teeth that is not treated. So it's untreated dental caries rather than experience or prevalence of dental care. I hope that I could uh, clarify this. Yeah, thank you. And I think you got into this a little bit is also not just looking between countries, but within countries. There's a comment here saying that particularly in the US, there's different regions of the country where there's um, really stark differences in the occurrence of oral disease. And how can you address those types of disparities within countries, not just yeah. at the- This is very interesting. As I, as I mentioned, we are trying to collect primary data from different, uh, uh, let me briefly detail a bit about this work that we are uh, doing well, we contact many uh, national boards and uh, institutes, ministers of health, researchers across the globe. Identified nearly eighty different eight eight zero uh, um, surveys with both oral health indicators and socioeconomic data. So the the, the work now is to harmonize national data and also for some countries like in the US, Canada, Australia, Brazil, we can have a, a subnational analysis. But this is the first part of the, the job is to describe, to denounce the socioeconomic inequality. This is a red no, but the originality here is that to have a broad and global picture. This is the first phase. The second phase that we need to move beyond that is a kind of simulation modeling. This is I would like to, 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 to highlight here because we are going to take some few uh, national-wide surveys and based on this data, we are applying some cutting edge methodology in terms of epidemiology to look at the real impact of some potential policies in addressing risk factors for oral disease. Let me give a brief example. Here in Singapore, we have a recent uh, implemented food labeling uh, policy. What's the impact of this food labeling policy in reducing sugar intake and which in turn uh, dental caries and in consequent tooth loss. The same is applicable for smoking, 
policies, and also for HPV uh, and oral health related cancers. So you are trying to modeling the impact of those policies because as you can see in my presentation, one of the key uh, targets is to address the commercial determinants of health. We believe that we need to, to target uh, upstream interventions, policies, and, and in a broad per perspective. And I'm talking with Ben, who is an expert in, in, in in, in smoking, tobacco policies, I think that's it's important to address this is a more broadly, that's the aim. So this is to give a few examples. We are conducting some uh, qualitative studies as well with people from the ground. So we actually, we are doing what a editorial published in 1977 in the International Journal of Epidemiology is state that we need to listen what people thinking about oral health. That's what we are doing. We are going to the floor to listen qualitatively, employing some uh, uh, qualitative techniques and methodology to listen from the uh, most deserved uh, people, more uh, uh, the private people, more uh, disadvantaged, socioeconomically speaking, people, what they think about their wishes and expectations related to oral health. I think that this will be quite unique. Thank you. I think we've got time for a couple more questions and there's quite a few coming in the Q&A. So we may continue this um, through the chat function, but uh, going in the order we re received them, there's a question here. You show a lot of data looking at social economic uh, inequalities as defined by income. In the United States in particular, there's a lot of attention on discrimination and, and differences by race and ethnicity and by other uh, social constructs. So to what extent is the Lancet Commission thinking about those broader definitions of, of inequalities in their work? Thank you very much. This is a very important uh, question that, as, as I said, this is a, a, a income education or use it here not because of our choice, because they are the most common uh, socioeconomic indicators that is relatively easy to compare and to harmonize. But if you talk about uh, ethnicity or race uh, as a social construct, it's much more difficult. I think that one, uh, Elena or Dandare uh, are going to address this uh, uh, topic in their, uh, in their talks uh, soon. But the issue is that uh, I recognize, absolutely, we recognize the race uh, uh, inequalities as well, that is part of the broad social determinants, is part, it's not the unique, and it's not confounded by socioeconomic position. There is a racial based uh, uh, influence on, on, on oral health, of course, and, and general health. We are going to consider this very uh, seriously. But again, the issue is that it's not like uh, uh, income or, or, or education. It's very difficult to harmonize the different uh, ethnic groups used in national wide uh, surveys across the globe. For example, if you look at the Africa, uh, in some countries, from if you use the, the US classification, all of the groups, those groups are be considered uh, from Afro-American or Blacks. But in that particular countries in Kenya, they have some different sub uh, groups based on different ethnicities. So it's very difficult to harmonize with the US and Canada data. The indigenous people is another, is another subgroup that uh, we are paying uh, attention. We have in our commission, uh, indigenous leader from Canada, who is a, 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 a senator in Canada and is a dental professional as well. So the voice of those people uh, will be listened and will be expressed in the Lancet Commission, definitely. Thank you for your preoccupation. We share the same. Thank you so much. The, it's a shame to cut this discussion, but we must move on. I think it will continue in the Q&A. So by all means, type some answers, some, some tough and thoughtful questions in there too, in terms of how do we go from the commission to real change. Um, so I look forward to seeing those responses and hopefully our audience will also turn their attention to our next speaker, uh, who is Dr. Dandara Hogg. And she'll be speaking to us right now. The floor is yours.
Hello, can you see my slides? Yes. Hello, everyone. I first would like to thank you for the opportunity to present at the symposium today, and thank you to all the attendees in this presentation. My presentation will start today with a critical reflection on the role of health inequalities research, and then move on to an empirical example where we adopted a structural intersectionality approach. So highlighting the role of structural racism to study these inequalities in oral health. I'd like to acknowledge Associate Professor João Bastos, Professor Lisa Jamison, Dr. Elena Shu, and Dr. Elena Constante for their contributions to this presentation. As pointed out in the presentation by Professor Marco, the field of dental public health has been characterized by a systematic documentation of inequalities in oral health outcomes across the globe. What we observe in oral health is in fact, one of the most obvious characteristics in society, the existence of substantial inequalities in wealth, power and social relations, which then find expression in differences in oral health outcomes between social groups. And this systematic documentation of inequalities in oral, but also more broadly in health outcomes has had a crucial role in advancing the health equity agenda. And it did so because this documentation makes a case. It builds the evidence that is needed for action. This essentially means that if we want to change patterns of oral conditions at a population level, we also need to change the social structures that we live in. And we need these more profound changes because the mechanisms that connect broader factors with health outcomes are replaceable. What this essentially means is that the consequences of fundamental social causes of diseases cannot be fully eliminated by addressing the intermediate mechanisms through which they operate to produce these inequalities. And this happens because enduring inequalities in other multiple axes of disadvantage, such as education, knowledge, power, prestige, beneficial social connections, they usually walk together. And these interactions ensure that these mechanisms are reliably replaced. While the contribution of studies that have repeatedly reported oral health differentials according to multiple dimensions of disadvantage is unquestionable, scholars in this field have suggested that we're still possibly missing a bigger picture here. This happens because the social determinants of health do not exist in a vacuum. They're also caused by something. And this consists of the political, social, and economic systems that we live in. And this is important because by not taking these factors into account, studies that report the social distribution of oral health outcomes rely on the idea that the recognition of the magnitude of these inequalities in oral health and health outcomes more broadly will be a reason enough to foster social change towards more equitable policies. As pointed out in a recent Lancet editorial, this reflects a rather naive understanding of what actually drives change in societies. And the most important consequence is the limited scope of interventions that end up being recommended in these studies. And so considering the knowledge that poverty and other forms of oppression are situated within a context that is influenced by historical, but also contemporary factors, in order to advance the field, these studies should articulate these factors, both when analyzing their data and also when recommending actions and policies to reduce these inequalities. Without a very clear specification of actions and policies to reduce these inequalities, more documentation of social differentials in oral health will likely achieve very little. In fact, this repeated documentation of a social fact when not articulated with clear strategies to address these inequalities may end up normalizing them and creating a belief that they are an intrinsic and unchangeable characteristic of society. While this talk so far has been very theoretical and it's challenging to think how this happens in real life, I propose we look at the example of racial oral health inequalities. So the way they have been conceptualized, the way they have been documented in the literature and which interventions have been proposed to mitigate these inequalities. 
A recent review on the topic has shown that while racial world health inequalities have been repeatedly documented across the globe, most of these studies have pointed out the socioeconomic disadvantage of racial minority groups as the main explanation for these health differentials across racial groups. In fact, most authors looking at racial differentials in oral health have taken into account a range of individual level socioeconomic factors like income and education. And what they observe is that racial differentials persist above and beyond these factors, suggesting that there might be other mechanisms operating at broader levels shaping these inequalities that we observe across racial groups. But very few of these studies documenting racial inequalities situated these findings within a historical context in order to explain such inequalities. So bringing concepts of racism, stigmatization, and so forth into their analysis and or discussion. Most importantly, no studies that investigated races at more structural levels were identified in this review. So this resulted in the proposition of interventions that were mostly focused on reducing socioeconomic inequalities between racial groups in order to reduce the gap that we observe in health and in oral health. But what these studies didn't take into account is the substantial evidence showing that the relationship between socioeconomic status and health is racialized. Mounting studies in this field indicate that socioeconomic resources, including education, income, and wealth, are less protective for the health of racial minorities, meaning that by only improving these socioeconomic factors, we are unlikely to reduce racial inequalities. So here we have an empirical example whereby not taking into account the historical processes and the current configurations of society, including the influence of racism at broader levels, such as political systems and relationships of power, studies in this area have contributed very little to the development of interventions that can effectively reduce racial inequalities. And this discussion intersects with the one that we observe in epidemiology more generally, which was brilliantly described in this piece of work by Nancy Krieger and George Dave Smith. The authors here argue that we try to quantify causal effects almost as if, as if we were trying to take a shortcut for the hard thinking about the biological and social realities that jointly create the phenomena that we're trying to explain. In this case, the racial inequalities. And the next thing you're probably thinking right now concerns the theoretical and the methodological challenges associated with studies like that. So studies that go beyond binary definitions of socioeconomic position and rather situate individuals according to different systems of disadvantage that might be operating through one another to shape inequalities in oral health. A theoretical framework that has gained more attention in research in health inequalities is the intersectionality approach. The central idea to this concept is that social categories like gender, race, sexuality, and social class are mutually constructed. So if we want to understand their effects on health, it is important that we understand this matrix of intersecting power axes. And it is adopting this approach whilst also considering structural indicators of oppression that we investigate racial inequalities in edentialism across the United States. This was done in a series of papers that have been now peer reviewed in the Journal of Public Health Dentistry and in the American Journal of Epidemiology. In our first study, which I'm presenting today, we aim to quantify racial inequalities in edentialism among older adults. And we also estimated how much of these inequities are explained by individual level factors like age, gender, education, and participation in the workforce. As a step to advance the knowledge in this area, we also aim to investigate how race, structural racism, structural sexism, and state-level income inequality intersect to determine the overall frequency of edentialism and also the magnitude of the racial inequalities on this outcome. And in order to achieve these objectives, we leverage data from two main sources. 
First, we selected approximately 108,000 participants aged 65 years and older who participated in the 2010 Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, the BRFSS. This is the largest ongoing health survey system in the world and collects data on health and behavioral factors from residents across the US. Next, we linked this data to state level measures of structural racism, sexism, and income inequality. These structural measures were derived by Patricia Human using multiple data sources, so including surveys, census, and also administrative data. The measures take into account several justice, educational, economical, and political indicators, and they classify the US states into higher and lower levels for each type of oppression. And each domain of these measures will be explained in detail in the subsequent presentation by Helena. In order to answer question one, we observed that the prevalence of edentialism was 1.7 times higher among non-Hispanic Blacks when compared to non-Hispanic Whites. So around one quarter of non-Hispanic Blacks aged 65 and over were edentulous in the United States. In order to answer question two, we have conducted multi-level models and adjusted them for individual level factors, such as education, gender, marital status, and participation in the workforce. We observed that even though the magnitude of racial inequalities reduced when we added these factors in our models, racial inequalities in edentialism were substantially higher in states with higher levels of structural racism, higher levels of structural sexism, and higher levels of state level income inequality. In fact, both the absolute and the relative racial inequality were larger where the levels of these oppressions were also higher. And so our last step was to look at the effect of the intersection of these three types of oppression on the overall prevalence of edentialism and also on the magnitude of the racial differentials on this outcome. First, let's focus on the effect of the intersection between these forms of oppression on the overall prevalence of edentialism. Our reference group for this analysis were individuals living in states where all three types of structural oppression were low. With the exception of states with high income inequalities, we observed that the combination of different types of structural oppression resulted in an increase in the odds of edentialism when compared to states where these structural oppressions were at their lowest. The intersection between high state level income inequality and high structural racism, sexism, for example, resulted in a 28% increase in the odds of edentialism when compared to individuals living in states where these systemic oppressions were lower. The combination between high racism and high sexism resulted in an increase in, of 38% in the odds of edentialism. And so now looking what these combinations do to the racial inequalities. When we combine this coefficient with the race coefficient from our model, non-Hispanic Blacks living in areas with high racism and high sexism had a 60% higher odds of edentialism as compared to non-Hispanic Whites living in states with the lowest levels of the three structural oppressions. This study expands previous investigations on racial inequalities in oral health. By incorporating a structural intersectionality approach, we overcome some key limitations of past studies, which have been mostly restricted to race and interpersonal forms of racism. From a clinical and from a dental curriculum perspective, this approach may help practitioners to better understand the contextual impacts of structural factors on their patients' behaviors and outcomes. This is important to increase awareness of our own biases regarding unhealthy behaviors and individual responsibility for change. Our findings also support the idea that broader systems of oppression need to be considered if inequalities are to be reduced. And this is ultimately a matter of political choice. On this note, I conclude my presentation and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, outstanding presentation, really thought provoking. 
I'm just waiting for a moment here so we can catch any comments in the Q&A. And while our audience is typing, I'll ask this. Do you see similar patterns in the literature, this, this combination of identity and structural factors um, beyond oral health? Is this, is this a general pattern you would say in, for chronic disease, even infectious disease? Yes, yeah, so uh, the measures, the, the systemic measures of oppression, they were um, developed by Patricia Human. And in the first study where these measures were developed, uh, an outcome of self, self-rated health, so general health, were reported. And the results that we observe in oral health are pretty consistent with what we are observing in the general health literature. Uh, I, I also would like to highlight that these um, measures of systemic oppression are uh, are something very new. They are still being developed. We're still learning how to develop them. So these are some initial steps towards trying to understand the cause of the causes um, of the uh, inequalities that we observe, not only in oral health, but also in general health outcomes. And I'll add too, you made a really good point at the beginning of the presentation, the importance of linking the findings to policy. And, and of course, made that full circle as we came to the end here. The policy recommendations are quite ambitious, um, certainly. Are there some first steps that you would recommend? Places where we can begin? Yeah, I believe the first steps is really to look in. Um, so Helena will be presenting each indicator that was used uh, to derive these structural measures. And if we look at those indicators and perhaps start with those indicators to try to, to achieve um, some more equity on those indicators, I believe that's the first step. And that comprehends different systems like the justice system, the education system, and so forth. So achieving uh, equity in those, in those dimensions will most likely reflect in, in structural forms of oppression being smaller. I think that's a great segue to move to our next talk. I really am looking forward to seeing how these, these two presentations complement each other. So let's turn it over to Dr. Elena Shu from the University of Pelotas. Can you see my presentation? Uh, John, could you help us and maybe switch the, the view to make sure that presentation is up? Nothing's being shared. Oh, there it, it's loading now. Looks like, yep, it's there. And there are a few more questions in the Q&A. Um, so Dr. Hogg, if you don't mind typing away um, in our next presentation, looks like some great points there. Can I start? By all means. <laughs> yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to be here with you all today. I will present uh, on advances on measuring oral health inequalities, and the focus of this presentation will be on racial oral health inequities. So as you saw, my presentation will follow and expand on Dandara's presentation. And as she mentioned, this work has been developed by a team of colleagues and friends to whom I'm very grateful. As Dandara presented, there are several limitations in the literature on racial oral health inequalities. The main problems observed are the over-reliance on simplistic theoretical frameworks and the over-emphasis on individual level data. When a single dimension of inequality such as race or gender or class, and of systems of oppression, such as racism, sexism, and classism, are conceptualized as independent risk factors for the unequal distribution of negative dental conditions, oral health scholars have misinterpreted the very notion of social determinants of health. Ignoring the fact that life is not unidimensional and that systems of oppression are interlocking, mutually constituted, and reinforcing, 
One tries to oversimplify the complex world we live in, which both limits our ability to propose effective interventions and may normalize racial health inequities as a problem of modern-day societies. Similarly, the overemphasis on individual-level data limits our ability to inform interventions that transcend the confines of individual responsibility for good oral health. These limitations are addressed in a new theoretical framework, the Structure Intersectionality Approach, which takes into account the multiple levels and dimensions to which social factors may act and interact to shape population health. When Patricia Holman and colleagues proposed this approach, as Andara mentioned, they also provided empirical evidence of, of applying this framework to evaluate self-rated self health. So, as Andara presented, we are extending this structural intersectionality approach to study oral health outcomes. Our first publication highlighted the oral health impacts of intersecting systems of oppression, moving away from dominant narratives on the topic, the emphasis of which is on individual level data and narrow conceptions of race, racism and the social determinants of health. We showed that the frequency of edentulism was higher among older non-Hispanic Black than white respondents. More revealing, though, was the observation that both relative and absolute racial inequalities in edentulism were larger where the levels of structural oppressions were higher. Building on that first study on American older adults, we then proposed to evaluate racial inequalities and the impact of intersecting forms of structure, structural oppression on the oral health of working-age American adults. Thus, we replicated and expanded upon this previous analysis by asking the following research questions. Do the findings identified for older black and white respondents extend to a larger sample of working-age U.S. adults? Do adults in subordinate positions across race and gender show higher rates of complete total loss when compared to more privileged groups? And are the oral health effects of structural racism, structural sexism and income inequality more severe among groups simultaneously marginalized across race and gender? Note that while question 1 replicates the evaluation of race-based based inequities, Questions 2 and 3 incorporate two individual dimensions of social inequalities, namely race and gender. Three different data, so data sources were used to answer our questions. All individual level information comes from the 2010 edition of a telephone-based survey carried out as part of the U.S. Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, the DRF-SS. By drawing prob probabilistic samples of over 400 respondents every 400,000 respondents every year, the DRFSS provides health-related data that are representative of each of the 50 U.S. continental states. These respondent data were linked to additional state-level information obtained from the study conducted by Patricia Holman and colleagues in the 2010 U.S. Census. So our initial sample comprised almost 250,000 BRFSS respondents, aged 18 to 64. Due to missing information on structural racism for 12 U.S. states and a small proportion of individuals with missing information, our analytical sample included 197,222 complete case observations. Our main variables of interest were at the individual level, race and gender. At the state level, our main interest was on structural racism, structural, structural sexism and income inequality. We focused only on non-Hispanic black and white participants, as our estimate of structural racism is restricted to black-white inequities across various life domains, which I will explain soon. The experiences of other marginalized groups, such as Latinos, may be purely represented in this measure, and therefore 
warrant careful examination in future studies. So in their study on the health effects of intersecting systems of oppression, Human and colleagues developed state-level indices of structural racism and structural sexism based on surveys and administrative data sources for the years 2000 and 2010. We used their measures to categorize U.S. states into four levels for each of their oppressions uh, examined. Nine indicators of black-white inequities across five domains, judicial, educational, political, economic, and segregation were combined into a global estimate of structural racism. For example, as measures of economic racism, three indicators were assessed, the black-white differences of unemployment, poverty, and home ownership. Structural racism estimates were not available for states with very small black populations due to census data limitations. And that's why our analysis are restricted to those 38 states with structural racism information. The states for which estimates are produced account for 99% of the total U.S. black population. The structural sexism index followed a similar approach and was derived from six indicators across four domains, economic, political, cultural and physical reproductive. For instance, the ratio of men's to women's labor force particip participation rates and the percentage of state legislature seats occupied by men were used as indicators reflecting structural sexism in the economic and political dimensions. Estimates of state-level economic inequality were derived from the Gini coefficient. As the theory and data to develop an index of structural classism are not yet available. The Gini coefficient is a traditional measure of the degree of inequality in the distribution of income or wealth. It ranges from zero, which would indicate that every member of the population has exactly the same income, to one, where a single person receives 100% of the total income. Self-reported identitalism was our dependent variable. And this condition was estimated through the question, how many of your permanent teeth have, you been removed, have been removed because of tooth decay or gum disease? Respondents who indicated that had lost all their natural teeth were coded as edentules, otherwise they were considered as dentate. Additional respondent level and state level factors obtained from the BRFSS and the 2010 US Census were considered in our models. So to answer our first research question and replicate the findings from the previous study, which focused exclusively on black-white inequalities, we evaluated the distribution of structural racism, structural sexism, state level income inequality and racial inequity in edentulism across U.S. states. These estimates were plotted onto U.S. maps in which states were the units of analysis. We then examined the association between race and edentulism in a multi-level logit regression model accounting for all individual and state-level covariates, including the intersections among structural forms of oppression. Looking at the spatial distributions of structural oppressions and of edentulism, we observe that the magnitude of structural sexism tend to overlap with that of edentialism, and that this is less pronounced for structural racism and for state-level income inequality. This finding corroborates with the observed for American older adults. It's also worthy highlighting the worrisome prevalence of edentialism in the middle of the country. Estimates from the multi-level model indicated that some intersections among structural forms of oppression significantly shaped the overall frequency of complete loss. In particular, the intersections between high structural sexism and neither high state-level income inequality or high, or high structural racism increased the odds of edentialism by 42 to 54 percent. In order to answer question two, which considered considers respondents simultaneously classified by race and gender and is therefore more in line with an intersectional framework, we determine the prevalence of edentulism for the whole sample 
as, a, as well as within each of the resulting four intersectional groups. The overall prevalence of edentulism among working-age American adults was 2.85%. We observed that the prevalence of edentulism was 2.7% for white men, 3.1% for black men, 2.9% for white women, and 3.3% for black women. Our findings suggest that black women were the most affected by complete tooth loss, and they reached the highest frequency of edentulism in 16 U.S. states, which are marked in dark red areas in MAT D, a finding that was unparalleled by other intersectional groups. Whether the oral health impacts from structural oppression are more severe among, among multiply marginalized groups was determined by estimating model predicted probabilities of edentulism according to all possible combinations of tru structural racism, sexism, and income inequality. To this end, we run separate models within each intersectional group, including all individual and state-level covariates. As the structural forms of oppression intersect, higher frequencies of edentulism are observed across most of the racial gender groups. The oral health impacts from structural oppressions were more severe among black men than any other intersectional category of respondents. Complete tooth loss reaches the highest level, 5.8%, among black men living in states with high structural racism, structural sexism, and high income inequality. Although to a lower extent, the oral health of the other race by gender groups seem to be all affected by structural oppression. Structural apps allow for complexity in effects both within and between groups. For example, black men vary in their exposure to structural racism, sexism, and classism, and this may result in within-group health inequalities. This is an empirical demonstration that only by integrating individual markers of social identity, such as race and gender, with measures of intersecting systems of oppression, such as structural racism and structural sexism, may we come to a more inclusive understanding of the patterns and root causes of population oral health inequities. In other words, multiple systems of oppressions need to be simultaneously assessed in health inequities research in order to provide a more complete picture of, complete picture of the relations between structural oppression and health. So, coming back to Dandara's presentation and to the foundations of our studies, intersecting systems of oppressions underline, underlie much of what we know as racial oral health inequities, as we cannot afford not to take this into account if we really aim to mitigate racial oral health inequities. Since we can't change outcomes without understanding how they've come about, Incorporating the multidimensionality and the complexity of the world to the analysis is paramount for us to be able to identify more effective, sustainable, and inclusive health equity promoting initiatives built on the concept of interlocking systems of oppression. And I'd like to conclude my presentation with this powerful sentence by, by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, a lawyer, American civil rights advocate, and a leading scholar of critical race theory, which says that if you see inequality as a damn problem or unfortunate other problem, that is a problem. Acting upon the interconnectedness of these oppressive systems is everyone's business, and I invite you to join us on this fight towards a fairer, more equitable world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shu. That was fantastic. We do have some time for some questions. I see we've been starting to clear our slate of questions from the last couple of talks. So those are coming through with a lot of activity in the Q&A. Uh, I'll start by, by making an observation that in, in these studies, you're really looking at structural oppression as an ecological variable, like living within a state that has higher levels of, of racism. Compare and contrast either methodologically or from a model perspective how the actual experience of discrimination at a person level may differ from the kinds of things you're talking about in this project where you're looking at um, 
living in a system or living in an area where, where um, oppression may be more prevalent? Uh, actually, we also conducted a study uh, evaluating perceived discrimination in Australia uh, with the same group of researchers. And uh, we were going to present those as well as a first step because we believe we need to evaluate the structural, structural uh, exposures because we are rely uh, if we simplify to individual level data, that is also important. But we miss this bigger picture, and we are uh, sometimes uh, biasing our our analysis by the report of the individual. That sometimes doesn't happen, and we are also we are also uh, missing the the idea that stru that structural oppressions affect not only those who perceive that oppression, but affect the society as a whole. It's not only an individual problem, but a societal problem. So we believe this next step of evaluating the structural problem uh, is one of the key uh, uh, approaches of this structural intersectionality approach that combines both the intersectionality of evaluating multiple dimensions, but also evaluating the structural uh, dimensions of the problems of the oppressions. And right under the bell, a couple of, of really thought-provoking questions and comments are starting to come in in the Q&A. So I will let you type okay. away. <laughs> well, we now turn our, our stage over to our final presenter, and that is uh, Dr. Karen Perez. Um, so please, the, the floor is yours. Can you see my slides? Yes, but I think we need to go to full screen mode. Yes. Here we go. All good? Can you hear me? Yes, looks good. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you, the USCSF, particularly Dr. Benjamin Schaaf and the Dean of the school, uh, uh, his team in elaborating all of this big symposium. Thank you for the kind invitation and the introduction as well. Uh, and thank you to the opportunity for the opportunity to present oral health over the life course disseminating and implementing evidence through a global consortium of birth cohort studies. It's a great pleasure to share a quick overview of this research I have been involved in for over two decades with a so broad audience. So my presentation today includes the following topics. Firstly, I like to give you some data to characterize oral diseases as a public health issue in the context of a life course epidemiology. Secondly, I will approach some brief concepts of life course epidemiology, and immediately after that, and more importantly, uh, applying the life course approach to oral health in presenting a few examples of published and planned studies conducted in population-based cohorts uh, that I have been involved in Brazil, Australia, and more recently uh, in Singapore. Finally, I want to announce and share with you the, establish the establishment of a global consortium of oral health birth court study and open the opportunities to everyone, for everyone who wants to participate in some way uh, in this project. Okay, um, as we saw in today's Marcos presentation, untreated dental caries and permanent and deciduous teeth and their consequences such as tooth loss together with severe periodontitis are among the most prevalent diseases in the world. Lip and oral cavity cancer are among the 50th. 
From this, I'd like to remind you about two essential pillars for this presentation. First, oral diseases and disorders are moderately or highly prevalent, most are cumulative and chronic. They cause substantial adverse effects on individual community and the wider society, as you, you can see, uh, you could see in the Michael's presentations. However, they are largely preventable and there are no ways to prevent them. So therefore, they fulfill all criteria to be considered public health problems. Second, Oral diseases are recognized as indicators of accumulated past disease experience and express the complex interaction of biological and social factors, as you can see in this picture. So I believe there is a strong argument for studying diseases within a life course perspective due to all of these reasons. Let me start talking in a more um, epidemiological language. Uh, epidemiology has clear roles that can be represented in a graphical scheme known as the direct acyclic graphic. DEX came from mathematical and computer science, but it has been used in epidemiology for a while. In this particular DEX, X is the exposure, while Y is the outcome. M is the mediator of the relationship between X and Y, C is the baseline confounder, and L is the mediator outcome confounder in the deck that I am exemplifying the main task of oral epidemiology. So task one is to describe the distribution of Y. So we are talking about descriptive epidemiology. Task two are to investigate whether X directly calls Y or calls Y via a different factor in the path between X and Y, which is the M. And task three informs intervention to act on X and, F and M and then modify Y. This slide displays the well-known scheme of a prospective cohort study, which can be considered the good standard of observational epidemiological studies. Such design strengths are that it allows us to investigate the natural history of the disease and identify risk and protection risk factors due to the establishment of a correct sequence of events, since a presumable cause must proceed with the effect. Large population-based cohort studies with several follow-up reduce the risk of recall bias. More recently, the implementation of counterfactual potential outcomes approaches may overcome the shortcomings of traditional regression models and allow us to assess causality. Some recent developments in the causal inference tools enable us to mimic, mimic like randomized control trials and then mimic and minimize uh, confounder and bias. So the use of properties of DEX also help us define uh, a theoretical conceptual model, making our choice about confounders and mediators easier. Okay, let me formally define life course. It's the study of long-term effects on later health or disease risk of physical or social exposures during gestational, adulthood, adolescence, young adulthood, and later life uh, epidemiology, uh, uh, in later adult life. It aims to elucidate biological, behavioral, and psychosocial processes that operate across an individual's life course or across generations that influence disease risk development. So bearing in mind what was stated at the beginning of the presentation, oral diseases are of moderate to high prevalence, chronic, take time to develop, and are mainly preventable. 
So we can state that oral health is an excellent field to apply life course approaches. There are, there are some examples of life course theories application on oral health based on findings from longitudinal studies. One is the critical period of exposure that states that there is a key developmental period that leads, leads to the condition later in life. For instance, a periodical infection of carous predecessor tooth in a certain specific uh, period may lead to the introduction to the, to the interruption of animal maturation causing animal defects. Critical period of risk with effect modifier is when key early life exposure interact with later ones. For instance, the low child socioeconomic status, for example, can be a sensitive period which will interact with later ones as a smoking adulthood for the development of periodontitis. The accumulation of risk theory has many examples like this one, prolonged inadequate plaque removal, low topical fluoride exposure and frequent sugar throughout the life with a dose response effect are very well known condition such as dental caries and tooth loss. And the chain risk. Interestingly, uh, can be represented by uh, the relationship between growing up to the private as um, environment in, in early life, which leads to the, to the exposure to a family violence and consequently can turn result in being a, uh, an aggressive behavior, which, is, can be, which can be a cause for dental trauma. Now, I'd like to show some examples of this approach to oral health by presenting studies conducted in the Pelotas uh, birth court study in my home country, Brazil. Pelotas has probably one of the most um, intensely investigated populations in the world. Currently, there are four ongoing uh, population birth cohort studies in the city. All of them includes oral health studies. It is estimated that one in the 15 inhabitants of the city is enrolled in one cohort study. This initiative was led, led by uh, a worldwide recognized epidemiologist and child health researcher, Professor Cesar Victoria, who I still consider my mentor after so many, many years. So the Pelotas birth court studies findings have been reported in hundreds of high impact factor journals publications, including nearly 100 papers with oral health data. I want to present a few of them, um, focusing on four topics uh, as shown in these slides. The first one would be uh, socioeconomic inequalities in, in, in oral health over the life course. Uh, the relationship between oral and general health, the longitudinal assessment of either sugar consumption and dental caries, and predictive models. Although there is evidence pointing towards the association of socioeconomic position and a series of health outcomes, most of these studies have cross-sectional design. Studies with a longitudinal design allow for constructing socioeconomic position trajectories over the lifespan and estimating its effects on health outcomes later in life. So in this paper published more than 10 years ago, we assessed whether three models of life course socioeconomic status, which means critical period, accumulation of risk and social mobility are associated with unsound teeth in adulthood in the 1982 Pelotas course cohort. Life course data were collected in almost 6,000 live born infants in 1982. Participants' oral health was assessed at 15 and 24 years. And we set family income trajectories and the number of episodes of poverty in the life course. We found a clear association between the number of episodes of relative poverty and unfavorable oral health outcomes as displayed in this slide, 
together with other outcomes uh, as student smoker, which is not a, a dental outcome. The adjusted prevalence uh, ratio for participants born into poverty was 30% higher uh, than those who were not. And participants who uh, were always poor had the highest prevalence of unsound teeth. More episodes of poverty were associated with a greater prevalence of unsound teeth in adulthood. In this study, we confirmed the critical period and accumulation of risk hypothesis. So let's move on. I want to report some of the, our studies on the relationship between general and oral health. I will present the relationship between breastfeeding and dental caries and breastfeeding and malocclusion. In 2016, the Lancet series on breastfeeding reported the effect of breastfeeding on several health outcomes, including two systematic reviews of oral health outcomes, malocclusion and dental caries. However, most of the primary studies in these reviews relied on the limitation in study design and the data analysis. So because of this, we aim to assess the effect of breastfeeding on malocclusion and prolonged breastfeeding on dental caries by using counterfactual approaches and taking some important and frequently neglected mediators and confounders into account, as you can see in this proposed DEX. The first study uh, was published in pediatrics in 2015 using the 2004 uh, cohort data. We hypothesized that exclusive breastfeeding presents a higher protective effect against malocclusion in primary dentition than predominant breastfeeding, and that using a pacifier modifies this association. As you can see in the, gra in this, in the graphs displayed in the slides, we got predominant breastfeeding uh, associated with a lower prevalence of different type of malocclusion, However, pacifier modify this association. Few studies assess the effect of breastfeeding, bottle feeding, and sugar consumption on children's dental caries. We, investi we investigated whether the duration of breastfeeding is a risk factor for dental caries in the primary dentition. And this was tested independently of sugar consumption. Breastfeeding was the main exposure collected at birth, 3, 12, and 24 months. Data on sugar were collected for 24, 48, and 6 months of age. And statistical analysis was run using marginal structural modeling to estimate the control direct effect of breastfeeding on severe early childhood caries. Children who were breastfed uh, at, for more than 24 months of age were had a 2.4 times higher risk of having severe early childhood caries than those who were breastfed up to 12 months of age. Importantly is to say that breastfeeding between 13 and 23 months of age had no effect on dental caries. So we confirm in this study that prolonged breastfeeding, which means being breastfed for more than 24 months of age, increases the risk of having dental caries. So let me talk about the longitudinal relationship uh, between sugar consumption and dental caries. Using the, the, the 1993 Pelotas birth cohort data, we assess the trajectory of sugar consumption and the increment of dental caries between six and 18 years of age. Surprisingly, surprisingly, there are very few longitudinal studies that prospectively examine this relationship. Sugar-related feeding practices were assessed at the age of four, 15, and 18 years of age, and then trajectories were modeled like low, upward and high sugar consumption patterns. Dental caries was clinically assessed at 6, 12, and 18. 
and covariates included sex uh, and life course variables such as family income, breastfeeding, mother's education, regular dental visit, and child's toothbrush habits. The findings. Here is a curated relatively constant rate for the study. Still, in sugar consumption groups, dental caries increment was slightly higher between ages 6 and 12 than between 12 and 18 years. Adjusted analysis showed that the dental caries increment ratio between age 6 and 18 was 20% and 66% higher in upward and high sugar consumer groups than in low consumers. The higher the sugar consumption along the life course, the higher the dental caries increment. Even low level of sugar consumption was related to dental caries, despite the use of fluoride. I included one example of predictive models, which are not very common in dental literature and in, in, in dental practices. In the uh, 1993 cohort study, um, malocclusions were assessed in the primary dentition at age five, and then later in permanent dentition by using DAI index uh, through the two different cutoff points. The first one was 31, which means highly desirable orthodontic treatment needs. And the second cutoff point was 36, which means mandatory treatment needs. Uh, after analyzing this data from a follow-up, having data from the, both dentition, primary and permanent, we could conclude that malocclusion in primary dentition, as you can see in the slide, uh, in different combinations um, were uh, a, important prediction, prediction for desirable and mandatory orthodontic treatment needs by age 12. Well, in 2012, I moved to Australia and came across of general anesthesia problem. GA, due to dental reasons, is not a common approach in Brazil. So although the use of GA for dental treatment has no benefits, in children exposed in early life to single GA, prolonged or repeated GA may have adverse effect uh, on the developing brain. So in 2017, uh, if you remember, the FDA had announced a warning regarding the use of anesthesia in children younger than three years. So we took the unique opportunity to investigate the association between early exposure to GA and the uh, educational performance of children aged uh, eight years in Australia. Educational performance was assessed by the Australian system called uh, NAPLAN, which analyzes different dimensions of children's school performance. This study was only possible through a data linkage process between perinatal data, databases, hospital and education data. This process uh, um, allowed the analysis of information from more than 70,000 children born in a given period uh, uh, in South Australia. So the prevalence, what we, what we found with this uh, huge data, the prevalence of performance below the minimum standard um, um, score was between 16 and 20% higher uh, among children exposed to GA before four years of age. And this association was found after control, uh, after adjusting for important confounders, actually several confounders, as you can see in the bottom uh, of this slide. So after moving to, to Singapore in, in 2020 and joining NDC and Duke NUS, we faced different experiences. For instance, uh, there is a birth cohort study there. In, in this existing birth cohort study, we may have the opportunity to investigate 
same hypothesis, previous tests in, in other birth court study, such as the Brazilian ones. Uh, but however, we uh, also may have the opportunity to experience the same hypothesis in, in a different context, as well as um, experience different uh, approaches as the use of microbiome as a presumable mediator between prolonged breastfeeding and dental caries. In Brazil, we don't have this type of data, uh, at least in the Pilates World Sports Studio when we, uh, when we uh, uh, had the opportunity to collect uh, data, data there. So uh, another different experience in Singapore that we are um, facing is because we are working in a, an Asian society, we are experiencing new, uh, just new research fields. For, for example, the SG17 study is a cohort that recruited about 3,000 elderly participants and participants and intends to follow them for the next 10 to 15 years. So our main aims uh, in this study are to assess the causal relationship between oral and overall health, particularly the relationship between oral and overall frailty and the bidirectional relationship between oral health and cognition. In terms of oral health uh, in, the, in the SG17 study, there are specific instruments for the age group into consideration, uh, as for instance, the oral frailty too. The introduction of oral health assessment via intraoral camera and intraoral scan uh, and the microbiome and genetic uh, aspects are very innovative in approaches in epidemiological oral health study. So we are now facing such uh, opportunity and hopefully we'll have some uh, good data to share uh, with you in the next uh, uh, symposiums and presentations. Well, after these years of work uh, with birth uh, cohort study and oral health uh, related birth cohort study, we have some lessons and challenges to, to, to share with you. Uh, first one, cohort studies uh, are powerful studies for applying causal thinking and causal analysis. And I believe we need to take advantage of this. Second, the importance of being involved in multidisciplinary and multi-thematic teams in court study was evident, given the nature of the oral diseases and conditions. Third, funding bodies are increasingly reluctant to support what we call the only uh, oral health research. So this aspect, I believe, uh, positive, positively reinforces the idea of multidisciplinary teamwork. In this type of study, there is a significant risk of lost follow-up, and therefore maintaining adequate sample size over several years is quite challenging. So in this case, data linkage has been increasingly used as a potential source of underused already available big data for longitudinal study in a more um, cost-effective way. Finally, with, without a doubt, there is a platform for an academic career alongside cohort studies, and this strategy should be encouraged. Well, based on these learnings, the idea of a consortium of oral health related world court studies came about. So I'd like to present to you the GLOBIX project, a global consortium of oral health related world court studies. This project was inspired by the workshop outcomes, which was held in Bangkok in 2019, when coordinators of 13 oral health related world court studies from different parts of the world met to discuss outcomes and challenges they had faced for many years. The creation of a consortium was stated in this workshop as a way to obtain many advantages from the data of this nature and the experience of the experts involved in such studies. So early last year, a funding agreement was made between Sing Health Duke NUS and the Borough Foundation to establish an oral health related birth cohort study. 
So the quartet of this project is currently in the National Data Research Institute Singapore, where I am uh, currently also based. So to help building this consortium, a small group of researchers was formed to advise along the stage of the project. In multidisciplinary cohorts and other consortiums with beyond oral health, a representative of the Borough Foundation to help us uh, align the project with the foundation proposals, and some uh, researchers with expertise in statistical methodological methods and sugar intake data collections, and also some research assistants. As you can see in the slide, we have uh, the, I'm honored to have uh, Dr. Ben Schaaf and his group and uh, as a part of the, this big team, which is helping us a lot in this new and very challengeable project. So the consortium has the following goals. We want to establish a global research agenda for oral health related work court studies. We, want, we intend to explore opportunities for analyzing, for analysis of pooled data to answer pressing research questions. And, consequ and consequently, of course, we intend that a long term collaborative network between the global world health birth court study will, will be established. And finally, uh, we seek to facilitate the development of the next generation of oral health related birth court study researchers and disseminate the result of the collaboration through scientific meetings and journal articles. Of course, more important is we intend to influence the of educators and policymakers. So how we intend to achieve this? The first step was the identification of our potential collaborators. We run a scope review published early this year in, and we found 120 oral health related work for study including more than 1400 articles uh, in this scope review. They are spread across the globe as expected. Most of them are located in high income countries. To achieve the first goal, we intend to conduct a consultation process with the coordinators of the cohort study to reach a consensus of a global research agenda. This process will take place in using the Delphi technique and should be completed by the end of this year. To achieve the goal two, we have two research questions for the multi-cohort pooling data pilot studies. Research question number one intends to assess the importance of the first dental visit during the first years of the child's life to prevent early childhood caries. The second research question is based on a common risk approach to non-communicable diseases. We wish to analyze global data on the effect of the introduction of sugar in the first year of the child's life, on early child care. Also, we want to investigate how different sources of URI modify this relationship. Goal three, establish a collaborative network. We select, how do we do that? Uh, we selected key cohorts to initiate contact and invited them to participate in the pilot bullet analysis. If you look at this slide, you can see dot points in different colors. The dot in blue are cohorts that have already positively responded to participate in the consortium activities. The yellow dots to have pending issues to be preserved in the coming months. And the, and the pink dots are the next ones to be contacted. At least so far, we have already achieved a good uh, geographical distribution guaranteeing a global representation of high, medium, and income countries. So what? the consortium has to offer for the participants. Participation in the discussion of data analysis and findings, co-authorships in all publications related to the pooled data. We have some resources to help that extraction for countries where this capacity is scarce and uh, they will be accessed to all um, other online materials produced by the consortium. So we are open, of course, to just for discussion uh, with different specific needs that we understand each country uh, may have. Well, uh, we are also creating a web page where all information about the consortium activities carry out 
carried out and in progress will be available. And the idea is to have participant profiles on this page linked to their activities. And I hope to share uh, with you all of your uh, of this information and assess the website very shortly. So this presentation has no conclusion, is much a, a method of uh, share old and new data and uh, this new project. And I'm more than happy to take questions uh, after that. So I thank you guys very much. Thank you all institutions that are involved in some way with this project and happy to discuss it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, fantastic combination of data and then looking forward to taking that information and building the consortia and trying to um, instigate change. I'll be watching the q and I think we've got time to take a couple of questions as they come in. Um, I'll start by asking one that is hard to answer, but in looking at your data on the influence of diet and nutrition and feeding practices in childhood, and then thinking about, all right, well then what should we do about it? Whether we're thinking about a critical period an accumulation hypothesis, does that mean we should be working with pediatricians who work with moms and the, very, and the youngest of babies? Should we be thinking about teachers and older kids? Should we be not even worrying so much about individuals and their behaviors and instead thinking about food systems? The answer is probably everything, but, but is there something your data gives you some clues or some insights on where we might have this, the best intervention point? Thanks for the opportunity to respond for, uh, about this uh, subject, Dan. And uh, as you know very well, I am uh, very much interested to, uh, to get more and more consistent about the evidence between uh, nutrition, diet habits, and oral health outcomes, particular dental caries and, and malocclusion. If, uh, if you think about our role in, uh, in, in being uh, in being working in the oral health field, uh, I think that uh, it's it's our obligation to stimulate a two ways conversation, and uh, in a different platforms. The first one would be um, in a more population approach and more population perspectives, which means uh, focusing on a common risk approach. So to answer your question, yes we should work very close to educational, people involved in the educational system and those who uh, work direct with uh, children since they are born, like uh, pediatrician, nurses, uh, and uh, target uh, those common risk factors like diet uh, habits and nutrition, stimulate breastfeeding as much as possible, given the benefits that this action can uh, promote to the mothers and, and children. But we also have the role as a dental practitioner nurse to have an individual conversation with patients and, and, and the kids when possible, when they are grow, since as early as possible, uh, advising about the potential risk of having dental care after um, a so long period of breastfeeding, but also um, informing them how to deal with this situation and what they could do in terms of individual perspective if they decide uh, to keep breastfeeding the kids. This is just one example. So uh, it's our role to promote oral health, but it's also our role to uh, inform population and patients uh, in terms of benefits and uh, risk of having uh, bad oral health outcomes because of some specific dental, uh, nutritional and diet habits. Thank you. I have three things I need to do before I send us home. And I'm gonna to try to squeeze those in quickly. Uh, and hopefully we'll then have time for, for one more question after that. Um, if you take a look at the chat, you'll see a link to an evaluation survey where you can give us some feedback on today's presentations. We're very interested in hearing ideas from the audience for upcoming symposia, speakers, themes, and also the format, the timing. 
in terms of how much time for questions versus speakers versus total length online in person. Please give us your feedback. We're, we're really interested to hear what you have to say. Uh, many thanks to the entire team for putting this together. Of course, all of our speakers, um, UCSF Information Technology Services with John Tess, huge help making this happen. Roger Moraz, of course, with our um, Graduate Research Affairs Office. This doesn't happen without Roger and, and all of our speakers today and, and the great support we've gotten from the School of Dentistry here. And a huge thanks for everybody who came out to make this part of their day. Um, we were having some technical difficulties with our continuing education link. Uh, Roger, is that available or will it have to be distributed afterwards? Uh, we're going to need to distribute that link to all the participants uh, tomorrow morning. Okay, so stay tuned. Sorry for the delay. The email. Um, yeah, apologies that we couldn't get it out to you right away. Uh, but that'll be out along with a, um, a link to our presentations and we're out of time. Thank you so much, everybody, for spending two hours with us this afternoon, this morning, wherever or whenever you are. Um, huge, huge thanks to everybody and uh, hope to see you again next year. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.